Okay, so I was given some tickets to go see Garbid live, and they were spotted by Maximo Park and Honeyblood, and I thought, it's quite an nostalgic night out, you know, I used to listen to these bands when I was younger, so it'd be quite a good night out. Obviously, Honeyblood are more new, but, you know, it's a good way to discover new music as well, which is something I'll go into a bit later. Now, it was down at the Digbeth Arena. This was my first time in the event, and I was expecting it to be indoors, so I went fairly lightly clothed. It had been raining as well, but I thought, I'm not bringing a coat to be sat inside, surrounded by people, you know, usually you're all huddled up and it's going to get very hot if I'm wearing a coat, so went fairly lightly clothed, and when I get there, I was quite surprised with the layout, so you go in, it's in an old abandoned car park now, it was by um, the Sunflower Lounge, so obviously I've been in there before and I thought, you know, it's just going to be another one of their indoor venues, but... It's the old industrial Birmingham so I said they're obviously renewing it and renovating it into new things. It's still pretty much a car park, but what's so special about it is they've sort of turned it into a mini festival layout. So it's got all of the tents, like there's merch tents, there's beer tents and food tents and, you know, tables and the festival sort of toilets. And then you go through the archways in Birmingham through them and it leads you to the musical area. So it's like... A proper festival stage with the barriers up close and you know the arches on either side for the railway lines and they've put neon lights on them so they glow and it looks a bit cool but it's a pretty cool and interesting venue for sure but obviously like I said I wasn't expecting it to be outdoors but I think it added to something you know it's a more unusual venue so it's a bit more special maybe for any artist or any people going to see it as well especially if you haven't really been to a festival before it's got the festival sort of feeling but without having to go to a festival so that was pretty cool so Honeyblood obviously I'd not heard of them before now I'm just going to start with the down treading of music because it used to be that I used to listen to Krang Radio a lot and obviously the Krang Studios were in Birmingham now they got rid of the studios because radio is becoming less and less popular so the radio station that I've got tuned in at the moment is Absolute Radio. But that's mostly repeats. So, you know, the odd new thing like Portugal the Man and the few other new bands that they occasionally rarely play. But mostly it's going to be the same songs every day. They do a no repeat guarantee, but it's not through the week. It's just in that day. And, you know, to comply with the no repeat guarantee, it does turn out that mostly the same songs are played every single day. So, you know, that's a bit of a downsize. And... It makes discovering new music, especially in an alternative or rocking sort of music, a lot harder. So, you know, bands are going to have to struggle more for discovery, especially with YouTube and stuff as well. It's like you have to really know the bands to search for them. There's not really a discovery system that's out there for music these days. So getting a support gig on a bigger band is a good way of getting yourselves out there or, you know, an event at a festival, you know, if you can be on one of the earlier slots on a festival, it gets you noticed, you know, people know your name, they'll know what to look for, and, you know, they've had the opportunity to listen to your music when maybe they went there for something else, so it's a pretty good way of doing it. So Honeybloods, they're a two-piece. Now that's going to come into effect later, why, you know, that might need something, but, yeah, anyway, they're a two-piece from Scotland. The music was pretty good, but, you know, I'm... Not gonna. Should I just go into it? Yeah, just go into it. Anyway, because they're a two piece, obviously they're gonna have to play a lot harder to, you know, get the music going and you put all the layers in to make it a really, really good tune. And live, you know, maybe that's a lot harder to do all that and have a stage presence. So, you know, most of the time they were either just focusing really hard on the music or the rare opportunity when they weren't doing that, they, they looked at each other and they had their interactive moments with each other, which, you know, they seem to really, really get off on and enjoy. So, you know, bouncing off each other. But, you know, maybe you need to throw in a bit of audience interaction as well, you know, look out at the audience and play to them for a bit rather than just bounce off each other, which, you know, obviously you can rehearse that a lot. But, you know, you just need to, when you're playing live, maybe incorporate the audience just a little bit more that being said you know like i say because there are two pieces they're going to have to work so much harder to it so there's probably a lot less opportunity to be free to you know look around and 
interact with the audience a fair bit. You're going to have to really, really concentrate on what you're doing when you're singing and playing the music at the same time. It's just going to make it a lot harder. Now, they had a cool dress sense. Like, the lead singer, guitarist girl, she was in what I would describe as a witchy dress. So she had a little beret on, so it's not a witch's hat, you know. That would, that would just be crossing the line way too much, wouldn't it? But, you know, a little beret, and then stars and stars on her tights and it was definitely a very witchy sort of outfit so that was a pretty cool style and the drummer she was typical drummer garbage you know drummer 101 sleeveless band top and then backwards cap it's very much the drummer outfit of choice so you know but yeah it's pretty cool pretty interesting band might be interested in hearing more from them i'm sure they'll be pretty big in the future then came Maximo Park, and of course, the lead singer, I'd say, he was very much, obviously I've heard their stuff before and seen their stuff before, not live, but, you know, the music videos, and definitely grew up with that, it's like, in my youth, and the nightclubs and stuff, definitely Maximo Park was everywhere. Anyway, yeah, he had a very Jamiroquai sort of style with his purple suit, and, you know, the way that he was doing his moves was very reminiscent of a Jamiroquai style. He took his jacket off after maybe the first song, but still, you know, he kept his style and, you know, he was known for that sort of style anyway, so. He did keep dropping the mic stands and the first couple of times a stagehand came and ran to come pick it up and then they just gave up in the end and were just like, yeah, he's, he's just picking up that all the time, we're just going to leave him to it because it was part of his show, you know, he definitely, he, there was one point where he was like, where's my mic stand? And he, it looked like he felt naked without it because he used it as his prop and, you know, to wave around and point at the audience. And he has a lot of stage presence and was definitely interacting with the audience a lot and looking out at people. So, you know, that, that's really what you need in a live show is to be looking out at the people in the stage and interacting with them a lot and not just, you know, focusing on your music. You know, I'm not being harsh on them. You know, they're, they're a new band, so, you know, maybe they're... And like I said, it's a two-piece. It's going to be a lot harder to do that. But, yeah, Maximo Park definitely pulled it out there, gave a good show, you know, a lot of the good music that you recognise and had a good time. Obviously, they're not necessarily together anymore. They were pimping their separate bands that they're in now, so they didn't actually mention them by name, though. So, you know, they're <laughs> like, we're in these other bands and we'll be coming back later. And it's like but you haven't mentioned what these bands are, so, you know, if we might be interested in going to see them, it might have been good to just mention the names of the bands, but, you know, maybe they were contractually not allowed. Like, I was contractually not allowed to bring a professional camcorder to the thing, so, yeah, it's like, you know, it wasn't allowed at the events. And, yeah, obviously they played for a while, and then Garbage came on, and Garbage, again, you know, very reminiscent. They said they hadn't played in Birmingham for 20 years. So mm. quite a while since Garbage had played, and obviously that was very much my youth sort of music. But it was good to catch up, and a lot of people, you know, maybe don't necessarily remember the word. And when she was holding out the microphone, and she was even saying with her past use of ecstasy, um, you know, her memory was fading. Then she was like, um, what song was this next coming song a B-side of? And it's like, well, you haven't even mentioned the song. <laughs> and even when she did, though, no one knew. So, you know, but yeah, she put on a good show. She was interacting with the audience a lot. She was um, very much avant-garde in style with a glowing dress and the makeup, you know. And avant-garde, whilst it's futuristic, it's also retro now because of the... No one really does the avant-garde anymore, but it's a cool style, so, you know, it's like, what is the future to you, the past? And, you know, it's a link to the past because she's an old band. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she put on a good show. It was definitely interesting. There were points where she started talking to the audience towards the end, and there was one point where she was, well, you know, talking about how there's this certain group of a isolated group of white people and she she paused for a moment and then just the most awkward cheer came out of one part of the audience they were like yeah and so I was like and it's like you're not quite getting it are you and then she carries on and she's like you know it's like this, this small group of white people that are completely racist <laughs> and then 
you know, she talked about that and then she just started telling people if they didn't like it to fuck off and it's like, you know, just leave, that this wasn't for them. And then, obviously, it may have been even the same part of the audience and a bit more, but there was a much louder cheer. It's like, awkward cheer, you know, it's like, oh shit, we're not racist. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it can't be racist in Birmingham, you know, if you live in Birmingham and you're racist, you're in the wrong town, that's for sure, you know, it's like, it's definitely in the wrong place to be racist, you know, maybe the council have a bad way of distributing people, because they section off races, so if anything, the council's been particularly racist with how they distribute council houses around the town, <laughs> you know, you should just evenly scatter people, you know, not care, not go, oh, this person's this race, we'll put them in this district because that's their district. That's the most fucking racist thing you could do the council, to be honest. That is so fucking racist. That That's one problem that I have with the council. It's like, of the millions of problems that I have with the council, but, you know, that that's just so wrong. You shouldn't do that, council. So you shouldn't go, oh, this person's this race. We'll, we'll section them off in their own little section of town. No! My God, you fucking racist! <laughs> anyway, you know, so she started on that. And then there were a few other things where she started a next song. It was talking about the the patriarchy and how, you know, men were in charge and, you know, if you don't like that, to fuck off. And then there are a few other things. At this point, you know, I was planning on leaving a little early to catch my last train and it's just been made so awkward to leave early. It's like, you know, you've been telling all these really bad people that you're not associated with and, you know, these groups that you don't want to be associated with. If you walk out from the very front of the stage, because I was front left, like right at the front, if you leave at that point to go catch your last train when she's telling all these really horrible people to fuck off, you know, it's like really awkward to leave right now, but I would really like to leave from my last train. <laughs> so, yeah, I ended up staying until after even the encore and then pretty much running for my last train. <laughs> Way to make that awkward. Uh, yeah, Shirley Manson, my God, you, you really made that last bit very, very awkward. You know, sure, you were saying some pretty important things, but, you know, maybe not tell people to fuck off if they don't like it, because if someone wanted to leave, especially when it's coming to the end of the the show when people might be wanting to catch their last trains, you just made it so awkward to want to leave for anyone. It's like, you know, especially if you've got to go through the crowd, people would just be so judgmental. It's like, oh, that person's leaving, are they? Are they one of those? Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was a good night and I had fun, you know. People were obviously in the introductory bands like Honey Blood and that, just staying back and eating and drinking in the festival area rather than at the stage area. But that's acceptable, you know, if that's what you want to do for your night. But I wanted to go enjoy all the music, so I was up the front. Sorry, my indigestion really is suffering a lot lately. But yeah, I mean, I went to the front, enjoyed it from the front of the show. And, you know, I pick a side. I don't go centre. I like to be able to see the whole stage without having to go, you know, it's a tennis match to watch around, you know, it's nice to be at the front side, one of the sides. They're more premium to me, you know, the music might get a little distorted by the speaker, but it's a bit awkward, but, you know, you're there for the live show and to experience the show, and, you know, whilst some people are there for the music alone, if you're there to see the bands and to enjoy the bands, that's a good place to go to see them and enjoy the show and experience in that way and that's maybe what I would go for but yeah I mean all in all they put on a good show who knows when they're ever going to be playing again because you know they're such an old band at this stage that maybe they're not going to be getting as many events and she was saying even about you know the music industry and how hard that is herself especially when they're an independent label and that was even in her day you know when radio stations and things still existed and they played all these musics and Nowadays, it's just even harder for any sort of band to exist. And she was saying it's all about the people you know and who you talk to and all of this. So, you know, that's very true as well. I'm so worried that my sound isn't even recording at this stage. But yeah, 
I mean, it is all about who you know, and it's not just in the music industry, it's pretty much in any industry. You've got to know the right people to get yourself elevated and get yourself promoted and out there, or, you know, get the right connections to do certain things and go to certain events and cover certain things. So it is very much having the right people on your side and behind you to support you and, you know, help you get ahead. And the downside as well is if you are being talked about behind your back, which a lot of people do to elevate themselves. I've noticed in a lot of industries, there are a lot of people who will make up and invent bollocks about people behind their back, just so that they can elevate themselves by proxies. Like, yeah, I talked about this person, I slagged them off, they're not getting ahead now, but I'm, I'm so much better than them, even though I invented all this bollocks about them. And I've just come across that so many times, and it's just like, I'm not going to resort to that. I, I'm not, I don't play those games. And you always find out in the end the, the shit that they've invented behind them. Because when people realise you're not like that, they, they talk to you and then you're like, oh, okay, they invented that shit, did they? Oh, yeah, and they've got ahead because of it. Mm, okay. And I see that's why I was getting picked on and bullied. Because, you know, you do get picked on and bullied by association because of the bollocks that other people have invented especially when they're friends with the right people you know if they've been talking to the right people and they're friends with the right people and they've invented shit about you so you can't get in the circle it's like no yeah, you, you don't want to know that person you don't want to let that person in the circle because you know they they just invent bollocks and shit that isn't actually true and then half the time they will invent shit and then start actually putting steps in to make stuff against you so you know I've I've experienced that so many times in different things that I've done it's just like no you know they're the side person that really shouldn't be elevated or getting ahead because they're the ones that are the toxic people and toxic people like that just need to be removed from everything but they they don't they get elevated and they progress and it's not good that toxic people like that are allowed to continue and they'll just invent fake apologies and just invent fake shit and then they'll just start spreading shitty rumours about people again it's like no you know learn from the toxic people and get rid of them have people on your side that are good for you and you know will help you and support you toxicity is not part of this city <laughs> to quote another band in a twisted way, but yeah, I mean, toxicity isn't welcome here, and I won't support it, so, you know. But yeah, I mean, you've got to find the right people, you've got to know the right people, make the right connections, and in social media as well these days, it's like, be on the right social sites, be on the right connected sites, and, you know, do things right. There are some things that I won't go on, like Reddit, it's like, that's such a toxic community, and, you know, just garbage site that I would never touch it, you know, maybe I've angered people by saying that, but I would never be a Reddit person and, you know, maybe that doesn't help with getting ahead in my industries and different things, but, you know, it's like, that's my choice to not be involved in stuff where <laughs> it can be so toxic, it's like, no, I'm, I'm just going to stick away from that, so yeah, you got to find the right people, make the right connections, but back to the event with the review that I was on, I was on a little sideline rant there. You know, so, <laughs> I blame you Shirley. <laughs> Shirley Madsen for bringing it up. But you know, it's so true though, she's so right about that. It's, and it's not just in the music industry, it's in everything, it's everywhere. You can't avoid it. But it was a good event, I had a lot of fun, you know. Paying full price, which I didn't, you know, I can't disclose where I got my tickets. But, you know, if you're paying full price, you have essentially a mini festival experience. It's not like a full festival day. But, again, you know, if you're just going to an event in the city, maybe you don't want a full day. You just want a few hours. And it's like a lot of people, when they go to these festivals, they just watch the last three or four acts anyway. So, you know, they will miss the majority of them when they go to these events at festivals themselves. So, you know, you got the festival event, you got the merch if you want it, you got the food stalls, you've got the beer. And they could cycle these in and out for different events depending on what they want to do. So, you know, that is maybe a good way of getting your festival cart in there when it's out of festival season as well. You could get your festival stand in there at maybe a miniature event such as this. 
but yeah, I think it was definitely worthwhile. And, you know, if you've always wanted to go to a festival, but you've never, you know, really had the ability, especially with temps and stuff, it's not really the most convenient. This is sort of a, a light entry into it as well. If you go to Digbeth Arena, you know, you can sort of have a feel for what it would be like because the stalls are on there and then a separate little staged area. That's sort of what it's like but you know obviously it's a very different thing but it was a good way of setting it out and a good use of you know an abandoned car park essentially in between two archways so I feel like they did a good job there with setting out the stage and it's definitely an interesting venue that I would like to visit in the future so yeah I would say both the events and the music playing on the bands you know they're still held up for all these years they're still pretty good Maybe they've got their own stuff going on. I don't know if Garbage still even do anything. I haven't heard any new music. But again, you know, maybe that's down to the way the industry works these days and the lack of radio and the hard to discover new music. Because I can imagine it's so difficult to get your music out there at all these days. But it's got to be a lot harder to be noticed and found. So, yeah, I mean, if you're struggling, I have some ideas of different ways that, you know, maybe things could help promote music, but obviously I'm not going to mention it here anyway. Thanks for watching, join us again for some more, goodbye!